Is this how this works? This is on. Great! It's time for the news and the return of the Pete. Hello! It's me, Pete Quinnell! Put the seat up. I'm short. I've missed you too. Ollie's had to take a day off due to checks notes. Pipe bomb related stress. However, I am contractually obligated to inform you that the poll on our community tab to determine the best promo of all time is still open and that the pipe bomb is an option you can choose. Roman Reigns nearly retired. Vince McMahon's name is banned from WWE. Becky Lynch shoots on Ronda Rousey and their match at WrestleMania 35 and more. I'm Pete Quinnell and this is the WrestleTalk News. Support WrestleTalk! With his WrestleMania 40 main events against Cody Rhodes coming up very soon, and that show being presumably where he'll drop the title, won't he WWE? Won't he? It's led to some of us feeling a bit reflective on Roman Reigns. Thinking back on when this record-breaking title reign began back in the good old days of 2020. The bad old days of 2020. In fact, I might have a video coming in the next few weeks that looks at this entire title reign in detail, which I am very very excited about sharing with you. Due to his immunocompromised status, Reigns took a few months off at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic began, returning at that year's SummerSlam in the brand new Thunderdome. But for those few months while Reigns was gone, fans weren't sure if or when we'd ever see him wrestle again. And as it turns out, according to Paul Heyman, there actually was a good chance that Reigns would never have come back at all. Speaking with UpRock Sports, Heyman said, He considered himself retired. He wasn't coming back. I was executive director of Monday Night Raw, and Roman was assigned to SmackDown. But every week I heard all the SmackDown writers and producers and personnel saying, God, I just wish Roman would come back. And I would ask, has anybody talked to him? Yeah, he says he's retired. He's not coming back. No way. Thanks a lot. Done. Finished. Goodbye. Of course, he didn't retire and embarked on one of the most noteworthy title reigns of the last few decades. We almost never got the Tribal Chief, which I think for all of its flaws will go down as one of the most pivotal and crucial characters in WWE history. I, for one, am very thankful Roman decided to return. On Raw this past week, CM Punk alluded to one Vince McMahon, daring Drew McIntyre to say the name of the person who crowned him the Chosen One. That person, of course, being Vince, but Drew elected not to mention that, understandably so, with all the current allegations and lawsuits against him. But that very likely wasn't just Drew not wanting to say the name, as according to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio, Vince McMahon's name has been banned from WWE TV and it is not allowed to be mentioned. Which is likely why reports note that the backstage reaction to CM Punk alluding to him was, oh god. But after the segment was over, there was reportedly no heat on anyone backstage. But while Vince is banned from being mentioned on WWE TV, he still owns a ton of TKO stock and investment in the company. But that number keeps dwindling down and down and down. As according to a new SEC filing, Vince McMahon has sold a further $100 million worth of shares. Since the merger was completed in September 2023, Vince has sold $1.2 billion worth of stock and still has over over 1 billion left to go, with his total stock reducing from 28 million shares to 15 million. Not even half of his stock has been sold yet. It seems to be the final fleeting mentions of Vince McMahon around WWE, as his downfall continues day by day and week by week. You can see us dive into the rise and fall of the entire McMahon family in this frankly excellent WrestleTalk original. Link is in the description. And on that note, we have our next WrestleTalk original going live tomorrow, where Ollie takes a look at the everlasting and deep on-screen, and more importantly, off-screen, rivalry between Triple H and The Rock. Here's a clip. But two names kept coming up where they would do battle with each other over and over and over, both in the ring and behind the scenes. I'm talking about Paul and Dwayne. I'm talking about Triple H and The Rock. Theirs is an oddly conjoined story of one-sided jealousy. Backstage sabotage rises to the very top of their respective fields and then coming back together in an oddly tense, coexistence. This is the eternal rivalry of The Rock and Triple H. This is Feud 
forever. Subscribe here so you know first when that video goes live. And genuinely, I think that video is fascinating. There are so many weird coincidences that link the two men together throughout their whole careers. It's awesome. For many months now, discussion has been a brewing surrounding a Drew McIntyre and his WWE contract, with reports noting that he still very much might not have re-signed with the company yet, having been in discussions for months. Drew has since undergone a huge heel turn and a dramatic character shift, embroiling in huge feuds with Seth Rollins over the World Heavyweight title and CM Punk over... well, CM Punk. This has led many fans to think he most likely will re-sign considering how highly positioned in the company he is, and Dave Meltzer has provided his insight on the situation. He wanted to do this new character, and if the new character didn't work out and the booking wasn't strong, the idea was maybe go back home and spend time with the family and take time off. But as it turns out, the character very much did work out, often being one of the highlights of Monday Night Raw each week, which again, from the phrasing of Meltzer's report here, would indicate that it makes it more likely that Drew will re-sign with WWE, which will make it it's such a shock when he turns up in AEW later this year. Another name that was being spoken about earlier this year with regard to an expiring contract is Becky Lynch, who's set to face Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania 40 for the women's world title, which, were it not for The Rock, Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes, and Seth Rollins taking over the night one main event, would be a contender to take that slot. That wouldn't be the first WrestleMania main event for Becky though, who headlined WrestleMania 35 alongside Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey. Becky, in that match, won the Raw and SmackDown women's titles via a botched crucifix pin to Ronda, which at the time had many questioning why the match ended with a roll-up and not in a decisive way, like a tap out to crown Becky Lynch. Well, according to her new book, Becky explains exactly why the finish was so jank, but do please take this with a pinch of salt because I don't have the book myself, I can't verify this quote, but it was tweeted and then reported on by Sports Skeeter. In her book, Becky Lynch revealed the finish for her WrestleMania main event with Ronda Rousey and Charlotte was supposed to be Becky tapping Ronda out clean. When Ronda arrived at rehearsals, she refused to tap out as her mother would never talk to her again if she tapped. I'm not sure why the finish would then be changed to a crucifix pin and not a decisive clean pin like after a big move, but regardless, we got what we got. Becky did have more thoughts on Ronda in general though, which she spoke about in an interview on the MMA Hour, believing that Ronda was mismanaged during her run in WWE. She was coming from a different industry, she was a star, and she should have been handled differently in terms of, I think she had a great first outing that everybody thought, oh, she can wrestle. And I mean this with respect, but she couldn't wrestle. But everybody treated Ronda like she already knew it. And in terms of that and booking, that wasn't done well. And now, a quick message from Turbo Jack. Manifest. Manifest the WrestleMania main event phone call. Turbo Jack manifests. Ah, well those Turbo Robbins courses for nothing. There's gotta be another way. Ha ha! It's for all you to sign up to patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk and support Turbo Jack! Become a turb! Where well, you get a shout out on this very show from me, his wrestler Turbo Jack. Like the machine gun! Alex Anderson! The roller coaster! Robin a coaster! Ah, oh, f it! It's Dana Puckett! The cleaner, Kenny Shaw! The British Bulldog, Philip Boy J. Smith Jr. He can last Sean for longer than you in the ring! Starbucks, Stephen Caster! And Shield Maiden, the Zorni. Turbo Jack wants you to go over to patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk right now. Sign up, become a turb, become a pledge hammer, get loads of exclusive content, a shout out on this very show. Watch the exclusive content like Wrestle Talk Extra with Ollie Davis and Luke Owen, Survival Series Remote Edition. Turbo Jack wants you, Turbo Jack needs you to do all that. And also, get on your phone to your local WWE outlet and, and maybe suggest to them. Just say, hey, Hey Trips, you got a, you got an extra little bit of room in that main event scene there. Doesn't seem too crowded. Turbo Jack, remember him? He's still good. He can still go. He'll bring his, he'll bring his gear. He'll bring his little merch stand. Turbo Jack for WrestleMania XL. Let's make it happen. Meanwhile, over in AEW, while the company has seen the debuts of Will Ospreay, Kazuchika Okada, and Mercedes Monet in recent times, one top star is still absent from our screens, and has been for all of 2024 so far, that being the former AEW World Champion, MJF. MJF lost the title to Samoa Joe at World's End and reportedly left to recuperate from multiple injuries, many of which had been accumulated through his world title reign. But now, it's nearly April. How much longer does it look like MJF will be out for? The short version is, we don't know. 
According to PW Insider, MGF was in Boston the week of AEW's Big Business Dynamite show to meet with company officials. What the exact nature of this meeting is, it's uncertain currently. But despite AEW removing MJF from the roster page, not selling his merchandise, and other ploys used to try and hint that he could be leaving AEW, that, according to current reports, is most certainly a work, and MGF is still under contract. As far as MGF's health goes though, according to PW Insider, he is still recovering from those multiple injuries, and there is no timetable for his return as of yet. Stay tuned to WrestleTalk.com to stay up to date as this develops. Sticking with AEW for the moment, one of their top stars has debuted a new look. Ahead of the Blackpool Combat Club's big match in Mexico for CMLL, what are you doing there, Matt Seidel? John Moxley revealed his new look in a video promo shared by CMLL Online, where Mox has finally shaved his head. I think it looks pretty neat. No, I'm not biased. Shut up. And changing topic completely, The Undertaker revealed on his Six Feet Under podcast that of all the people to break his WrestleMania streak, he thinks it should have been Bray Wyatt. Wyatt faced Undertaker at WrestleMania 31, the year after the streak was broken by Brock Lesnar. Taker's only other WrestleMania loss was against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 33. But speaking on it on his podcast, he thinks it should have played differently. The most logical person to break it would have been Bray Wyatt. For him to be able to have broke it would have been such a feather in his cap and is something that would have probably could have extended the character of The Undertaker in a different capacity. But I think of all the people that it would have helped the most, I think Bray would have been the guy. He's the only one. Which makes a lot of sense considering fans had logically drawn a lot of comparisons between the two characters and saw Wyatt as the next Undertaker. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And finally today, Let's talk about why The Undertaker doesn't like cucumbers! It's been an infamous part of wrestling lore for a long time now that Undertaker is afraid of cucumbers, but where did that come from? On a Q&A on Undertaker's Patreon page, Undertaker has a Patreon? I bet you it's not as good as ours, patreon.com forward slash Russell Talk, the dead man revealed where his hatred of cucumber came from. Why do you even give me some bullshit question like that? I don't even like talking about the cucumbers, man. All right, here it is. When I was just a wee little Undertaker, like a kindergarten, first grade Undertaker, I come home from school one day. My mother had taken a bunch of fresh cucumbers and had cut them up into slices and had them soaking in a big bowl of vinegar. It was that day. At that time, it was the greatest thing ever. So I proceeded to eat the whole bowl of cucumbers soaked in vinegar. Well, something about that didn't settle well with my stomach. Shortly after I ate all of the cucumbers, I expelled all of the contents of my stomach. From that moment on, the smell, for a long time, even to see a cucumber, I would get somewhat, I wouldn't say nauseous, but queasy, smell a cucumber, forget about it. My stomach is just like, nope. Which is why then Paul Bearer famously pranked Undertaker on multiple occasions, leaving cucumber for him in various locations, including, according to Taker himself on this Q&A, inside everything he owned, even at the bottom of his iced tea on one occasion. Oh, Paul Bearer, you little scamp. Now, before the next WrestleTalk original goes live tomorrow, check out our last one detailing a history of Rock's WWE politicking. It's really interesting. Promise.